Welcome to Impact the World, the show for and about creatives, change makers, and entrepreneurs. This is a conversation episode where a special guest shares with me what they are creating and the behind the scenes journey of their experience. I knew that somebody I wanted to have a conversation with for Impact the World was Scott Stabile. Scott is an amazing author, love activist. In his history, he has been a screenwriter and a filmmaker. And he and I got connected a few years ago when he was releasing his book, Big Love, which is fantastic. And Scott and I actually had a very uh, all over the place conversation, um, including talking about our upcoming event, which we are holding in February 2020 at Osilomar. It's called Creative Empowerment. So if you enjoy our conversation and you feel like you'd like a deep dive around living a creative life with Scott and myself, check out my website, leeharrisenergy.com. But in the meantime, enjoy this conversation with Scott Stabile. <laughs> so welcome to today's episode. I am laughing because I'm here with a very good friend, Scott mm -hmm. Stabile, who is to me a very bright light in our world around mm. creativity and what you put out. And we're going to try and be serious uh, intimately <laughs> throughout this. No, that's fine. It's, it's great. And thank you for being here. It's a pleasure, yeah. So you and I met uh, because I happened to, someone forwarded something to me that you had posted online on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who don't know Scott's work, he has a really, um, a really powerful platform on Facebook and on Instagram. The best way I could describe it is you just tell truth really well in, in poetic and impactful and digestible ways. Thank you. Whether it's a quote or whether it's a paragraph. And, and that was what got me when I first um, read something. And of course, you and I both used the phrase big love. Mm -hmm. And someone said, oh, you should see this guy, Scott. So then I got your book, which was just coming out around the same time, which for those of you watching is, is here with us, Big Love, The Power of Living with a Wide Open Heart. And knowing you personally, I know that you make that your mission. Yeah. So welcome and thanks for, thanks for doing what you do. And this, this podcast, really, I wanted to speak to creators about why they do what they do. So if we can like go back to the very beginning, like what was your childhood like around creativity <laughs> and being a creator? And I'm you can laugh laughing. as much yeah, as you I'm like. I'm only laughing because I'm thinking back to five minutes ago before we started filming when you said to me, don't fuck this up for me. Yeah, I like to put the yeah. pressure on Scott. It's important. So I'm feeling very relaxed. Good, and home. that's yeah, how yeah, I yeah. wanted you to be. Yeah. What was my childhood like around creativity, yes. did you ask? I don't know that it was a, I don't, I don't reflect back on that as an especially creative childhood. You know, beyond playing games and makeup and not wearing makeup, I mean, making things up, you yeah. know, with friends in the neighborhood and playing sports. I don't think I really came into my creativity until late into college. You know, I went to the summer before my senior year in college, I went to this on this literature program for six weeks. And it was at a camp in on Lake Winnipesaukee, which is this really beautiful lake in New Hampshire. I don't know if you're aware of it, mm -hmm. but it's really beautiful and surrounded by mountains and we spent six weeks studying the transcendental authors like Emerson and Thoreau and the Emily Dickinson and all these people who were speaking to being who you are in the world, essentially. And our, we didn't have, for six weeks, all we had was a journal. And they said, here's your journal, everything we're studying in class, everything you're doing here, just write it down, keep it in your journal. It's the first time in my life that I kept a journal. And I'd always been drawn to English and I'd always been good at writing, you know, but I'd never really just shared my thoughts kind of journal style and approached my day to day experience with, uh, with, you know, compelled to sit down with the journal and talk about what did we do today? Mm -hmm. And how did I feel about what did we do today? And that was really, I think, when I started opening up more to, to creativity, you know, and to actually and to self exploration, mm -hmm. to kind of sitting with What's going on? How am I feeling about what's going on? You know, what does this look like? 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It does. So, so writing really wasn't a, a thing for you in your younger years. It just kind of burst Not forth. Wow. Yeah. It wasn't. A, it was a thing in as much as like I was always a, a top English student. Mm. You know, I always got A's on anything I had to write for class, but I was never writing on my own outside of school. I was never really drawn to doing anything, right. you know, like that. Yeah. Right. And now, now do you write most days or? It depends on the day. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm not a writer who is like butt in the chair every day, mm. no matter what at all. I can, after Big Love came out, I went months without writing. Mm. And I think in part because I put so much energy into writing Big Love and creating it. And once it was out, my energy was still with the book. It mm -hmm. didn't feel like a time to shift into anything new because I wanted to promote the book. And, you know, so I wasn't writing for months. And then, of course, your mind, my mind started thinking, you'll never have another idea again. You're <laughs> never going to be creative again. And then suddenly, you know, you sit down and you start writing. I mean, I was writing little things sometimes for for social media, but even mm. that, I was mostly just recycling mm. things that I'd already written. I've written tons of stuff for social media, lots of memes, lots of one and two sentence things, so it's easy to reuse those. You yeah. Know? Um, so no, I, I my approach to writing now is, if I'm not working on a specific project where I'll be much more focused and diligent and will be like showing up at the computer, butt in the chair, if I'm not doing that, it's just like, if you feel like writing, write. Yeah. There aren't rules about it. You know, you're not a, you're not a, you're not only a writer if you're someone who's writing every day. Yeah. You know, I think it's totally okay to go months without writing if you don't feel compelled to write. And then sometimes when I do feel compelled to write, it's a frenzy, you know, and that's okay too. I think that we sometimes feel like we use rules to belittle ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, and to call ourselves or to take away from being a writer or a creative or a singer or whatever it is if we're not, if it's not something we're invested in daily. You know, I'm not somebody who's, I'm not really somebody who feels like if I'm not writing, my life would be over. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some people who ascribe to this, this feeling, and I believe it's true in them, where it's like they wouldn't be able to move through life if they're not writing. Mm -hmm. It's the thing that centers them the most. Mm -hmm. And I have a different relationship with writing. I enjoy it. Sometimes I really enjoy it. Sometimes it's totally awful, you know, and grueling. Um, but I feel like, I feel like a writer, like I'm a writer because I choose to write sometimes, yeah. you know, and that's all it takes. We don't have to, we don't have to limit ourselves by definitions and rules and restrictions. Mm. I think it's okay to approach your creativity however you feel compelled to approach your creativity. Mm. You know, and then also, I feel like I'm talking. So I had an espresso shot before this. <laughs> I'm jet lagged, but That's that espresso good. shot shot work. Jet lag yeah. plus espresso, no, I'm fantastic. Like, ah, nah, nah, nah. This is good. This so is a good to just Tuesday. Stop me when you need to no, stop don't me. worry. It's great. Yeah, I just think rules are bullshit, especially yeah. when it comes to how we're defining ourselves. It's like what works for this uh. person isn't necessarily going to work for me, and that's okay. And uh. what works for me isn't going to work for I'm you. I'm so glad you're saying and that's I, okay. Yeah. I, I, I say this about uh, spirituality and self-growth, and I, I feel that working in this field that I've worked in for 15 years, um, I, I get a little exhausted and annoyed by the rules that I see being put on people as if they are blanket for all, because, yeah. uh, you know, I just know that none of us are built that way. We're all unique, we're all individual. So I, I also think it's so important that you expressed how we go to those rules as a way of beating ourselves up. I often think we go to those rules when we're afraid. Yeah. We don't tend to go to those rules when things are flowing. Yes. When things are flowing and we're just in life and, you know, yeah. but it can often be, oh, okay, well, if I just work harder at this, mm -hmm. X will be okay. And it's usually, no, nah, X doesn't feel okay right now and yeah. that's okay. And I, I love that about your writing because you give such permission to feel the crap yeah. which I think is still fairly new in our world compared to what you and I grew up with when we were little. You didn't really see advocates of the difficulty and acknowledging the difficulty yeah. in life. Yeah. And, and I love that about what you do on social media especially because I feel like you give everyone permission to go, 
oh, thank God, it's not just me, and I'm not yeah. the only one thinking this about myself, and it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, I feel like there's more of that now than ever, which mm. is great. I love seeing that. I love people talking about the shit instead yeah. of pretending they have it all figured out. Yeah. No one has it all figured out, mm -hmm. or very, you know, point zero 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 one percent of the people mm -hmm. have most of it figured out, maybe, yeah. and are sitting in this state, you know, but most of us are struggling yeah. and figuring it out along the way. And I think so much for me about what's helped me in my life creatively, what's helped me in my life just in terms of my relationship with myself is just checking in, like checking in with myself and checking in with my body, checking in with my spirit. How does this feel? Mm. How does it feel to be sitting at my computer right now? and showing up and writing? Is this something that I want to be doing? Mm. Am I in alignment with my heart space right now? And if so, beautiful. And I don't always do this, by the way. I push myself in different ways when I'm clearly not in alignment with my mm. heart space. And that's part of it too. Yeah. You know, we can't always show up for ourselves the way we want to show up for ourselves, but can we still offer ourselves gentleness? Can we still remember we're human, yeah. even when we're not showing up how we want to or need to? Yeah. That's and, human. And that's also where the growth will lie. So rather yeah. than thinking you shouldn't be a certain aspect of yourself, how do you love yourself when that aspect shows up that Absolutely. you don't enjoy so much? Absolutely. Which I love about this book, Big Love. You, in a way, it feels like you take a series of chapters of your life. Every mm -hmm. chapter is dealing with a different chapter or aspect of your life. And yeah. it's, it's beautifully written, of course, because it's you. But it's okay. also... Um, this, I feel like what you do so well in the book and in other parts of your writing that I've seen online, although there's less room to do that online in a way, um, is you zoom in and you zoom out and you let us zoom in deeply mm -hmm. on how it felt and then you zoom out and see the bigger picture. Yeah. So it gives that kind of effect. And one of the most powerful chapters in the book for me is when you shared about the movie, <laughs> The Oogie Loves. And we're laughing because... I knew The Oogie Loves was coming. I, uh, when I first spoke to Scott about this, I went, oh, I love the chapter about the Oogie Boogie movie. <laughs> and he laughed, because it wasn't the Oogie Boogie movie. No, I was thinking of Tim Burton's Nightmare yeah. Before Christmas. But I'll just share what I loved about that yeah. chapter, and then perhaps you can Absolutely. riff on it. The things that I still remember, because they were really golden for me, you had this movie contract. Mm -hmm. Everybody involved in the movie, you were writing this movie, everybody involved in this movie thought this was gonna be the next big movie mm -hmm. and that it could be a franchise. And I remember specifically you talked about, we talked about the merchandise and you mm -hmm. thought, oh my God, this is gonna launch my career and I'm not gonna have any money worries because you know the action yeah. figures are gonna be selling yeah. for years. Yeah. And I was reading that going, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I was in on it too. You know, I was there <laughs> spinning the roulette wheel with you going, yeah, we're gonna win. And then fascinatingly, it, the movie bombed. Yeah, and epically it, so. And it's one of like your biggest lessons. So share your, your, you know, what you'd like to share about that chapter. Because for me as a creator, I knew that so well. Yeah, I mean, the chapter for me is about a couple of things. And the experience of the Ubi Loves was, it is, it is still to this day, the lowest grossing extra wide release movie. I'm so in proud of you. Thank you. I'm so proud of you. That's yeah, awesome. I, I wrote the biggest bomb. Why be in the middle? Which I actually you can... can smile. Exactly. I can smile about it now and I'll, I'll take some weird pride in it, <laughs> which brilliant. wasn't the case in the moment. Um, it was very humiliating yeah. and painful. Of course. You know, very painful. And to, to I mean, for a couple of different reasons. One, just from a creative standpoint, to be openly and overtly and snidely mocked. I mean, not me personally, necessarily, because it's, you know, it's more than just a writer, but still you take everything. I took everything very personally that was said about the film. So that was really hard um, when this is my first big creative thing to have a, mm -hmm. a script turned into a movie was a huge deal because um, the odds of that happening are slim. And then to have that movie actually make it into theaters was a huge deal. So um, to have it roundly scorned was painful. And then at the same time, as you mentioned, I had my financial future kind of built into the success of this movie. They were talking about sequels before the mm -hmm. original one even came out. And I thought, wow, this could, this could really be something. I mean, this could really set me up in a, a very comfortable way. So we knew on day one, I mean, the day of release that it was, 
shit. Like, right. all of it was not. Everything we had imagined for it was not going to happen. And can I ask, at what point did you know <clears throat> that the movie wasn't good or wasn't what you had hoped it would be? Like, did you see early rushes or was it, like, the premiere or...? Yeah, when I... When did you know? Talking about... This is, this is what I have trouble talking about in, in the context of it, saying the movie wasn't good because... One thing I, I really feel that, that creativity is very subjective. Mm. And I know that so many people worked really hard on that movie. Mm. So for me, I did see the movie beforehand. I was, if I'm being honest, I was, I was surprised that it had a theatrical release. I thought it, it felt more to me like something you might see on TV, mm. something you might see more on PBS, mm. like a Barney style thing or a Teletubby style thing. That was more of the feeling of the film. So I was, if I'm honest, I was nervous about the film after mm -hmm. seeing how it was coming together. And I also recognized that it was a film for three to five year olds. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really the target audience. So I had the, the good fortune of being, we did a mommy blogger tour before it, it came out. So we went to different cities and, and invited mommy bloggers. There's a whole world, I don't even know if you know what that is, there's a world of mommy bloggers out there, like moms who uh, blog about everything to do with moms. But wasn't Glennon Doyle Melton... That's how she started. Momastery. Yeah. Mom, like, momastery. Momastery. momastery yeah. yeah. She's much more than a mommy, you know what I mean? Oh, that's yeah, how now. she got her start. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought that was yeah. her start. Yeah. So there was a world of this, and, and we, would, we would have moms come with their kids, and one of the, the cool things about The Oogie Loves is that it was... The, the creator, the producer, um, Ken Weisselman, had a really great idea. He said, listen, I want to make a, a Rocky Horror for children. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with Rocky oh, Horror? It's fantastic, yeah. <laughs> so what he was saying, and I got it right away, I'm like, that's a great idea, was the idea of creating a movie for kids where kids would be invited in the theater to get out of their seats and interact with the film. So throughout the film, there are all these different prompts where kids are meant to stand up and dance with the Oogie Loves or scream things back to the screen. And I thought it was a really fun idea. Um, so that was the essence of what we were trying to create. And we did the Mommy Vlogger Tour. Right. And kids were showing up and kids were getting out of their seats and dancing and having this great time. And so I'm watching this happen, you know, not long before the film was slated to come out. And I'm like, maybe this movie's going to work. <laughs> like, yeah. like, I wasn't really seeing how it was going to work, you know, but I'm like, maybe it is going to work because these three-year-olds seem into it. Yeah. So I was getting excited as, because this tour was happening right before the release. Um, but I was nervous. I was nervous. It didn't feel like a, a theatrical film to me, honestly. And that's a really good point because that, <clears throat> that to me, is, is where context is everything. So I, I've been a film buff all my life, yeah. a little less now, obsessive about it than I used to be, but I still read Box Office Mojo, I yeah. still look at Rotten Tomatoes, and I, I, I like to study it all. And so many movies I have loved were slated when they went into the theatre because they weren't viewed as tentpole movies, you mm -hmm. know, they weren't the big blockbuster, and yet you see them on the smaller screen or on an airplane, and it's, it's a gorgeous piece of art, but it went right over the critics' heads because... So I can understand... I'm not suggesting that. <laughs> no, that's what we're saying. Yeah, it's a gorgeous the piece of Loves is a masterpiece that... No, but, <laughs> I, but, but I guess I'm just... Support. We're going to rewrite history. But what I want to also point out is you did share with me that it has a bit of a cult following, which is Rocky yeah. Horror. So Yeah, I'll tell you, we were just... You and I were both just interviewed as part of a, a creativity... Summit. A spirituality summit. Yeah. So Jacob, after we... Jacob is the guy who interviewed us. Well, you know that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks for clearing that up. You forgot last I did. Week. I had. That was last yeah. Thursday. But he, um, after we spoke, he wrote me uh, an email. He said, I have to share this story. After we hung up, I was talking to my 22 year old son, and we were talking about our conversation, and he brought up the Ubi Loves as well. And I was telling my son about it, and my son said to me, you know the guy who wrote the Ubi Loves? And he was obsessed with the Ubi Loves. So I think for like, 22 year old well i don't know that his son's a stoner but i'm going to assume maybe yeah um there was a bit of a cult following yeah you know yeah yeah and 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 as someone who studies box office mojo that the most interesting thing on box office mojo is the hits and the misses really yeah. i'm yeah. not so interested in the middle i'm interested in wow that really made its budget like yeah. million times and that one cost the studio so yeah. I'm curious, how long did it take you, do you feel, to, to kind of re recover from that experience? Because it wasn't too long after that you started your Facebook page. 
It was because, well, this is a few things about the Yogi Loves. It was because of the Yogi Loves I started my Facebook page, which is also for me a great lesson. Like you plant seeds and you never know mm. how you'll, how they'll harvest, honestly, mm. because the PR guy said, listen, you should start a Facebook page as the writer for the Yogi Loves and you can engage with fans and you can promote the film. Well, the film, I mean, there were no fans or there were very few. <laughs> so there was no one to engage with, you know, and there wasn't, and it was in and out of the, the theaters in like a day and a half. So there wasn't a lot of promotion to do. But suddenly I had this Facebook page that, and I'm like, well, what do I want to write about now? I'm like, well, write about the things that you're, you're excited about, things like love and compassion and kindness yeah. and facing fears. And that's the whole way my page came to be. So if it weren't for the Yugi Loves, I don't know that I ever would have started a Facebook page. Maybe, I don't, can't say for sure, but it was because of the UV loves that I did. And it's, I'm certain big love wouldn't exist without the audience that I was able to show up with to the publisher and say, exactly. they loved my book. They loved the sample chapters, yeah. but in this day and age with nonfiction books, especially, it seems like publishers really want you to have a platform. Like, yeah. So I, I look at all of the gifts that the Oogie Love has, has, they gave me, along with the creation of it. It was really fun to write mm -hmm. it. The, I feel like I need to speak to the, the moment it came out and what happened for me, because for me, that was me seeing that it, it ultimately doesn't matter how your creativity is received, yeah. right? It's like, are you going to choose to show up and continue to create? I was really depressed for, I'd say, two weeks, which sucks to be really depressed for two weeks but given the the magnitude of the failure mm -hmm. i'm like two weeks isn't so bad and mm -hmm. it's not like i was over it right away after two weeks but i wasn't in that pit of feeling humiliated and and in despair and i don't think i ever questioned that i would create again it's not i never hit a place where i was like forget it mm -hmm. i'm never going to go after this again i'm never going to do this again i think some part of me understood that you're, uh, you have no control over yeah. how your creativity is received. You only have control over your willingness to keep moving forward with it, right? And what I love about you sharing that is I, <clears throat> like I think of, it, it, the Uki Loves reminded me of kind of the dreams I had of my first music album when I was 23, mm -hmm. 24, and I yeah. thought, oh, this is great, this is destined. Like, yeah. you know, it might not be a big hit record, but it's gonna at least get me into the record industry. It's gonna, I, I wanted to make the second one, yeah. and, and I knew I'd do better on the second one, but that didn't happen. And so for me, I had a similar kind of like deflation and oh my God, I, but I, you know, I, I followed all the signs. It felt like things yes, were moving, yes. but the money came. What, how could this, how could this be? And of course, years later, I'm, I'm still doing music and, and I learned so much from that experience. But equally, I feel sometimes very untouched by success as well. Mm. Like there are things that I've done that have been quote unquote successful in other mm. people's eyes and in numbers and, and, it, and it, it's nice, but it, it's nice for about an hour. Yeah. And, and more importantly, what I like about it is what it connects you to. So yeah. I feel like with the work I've been able to do and like you I had an audience gather around it, you know, it leads to things like this where we can sit Absolutely. here and create this. Absolutely. And this is the next step. And who knows what we'll be doing in five years. But you're so right that the, the inner creative life force is very separate to wish fulfillment and healing. They're, Absolutely. They're separate. I think it's important as a creative to find an audience for your work uh, at some point, at some level, because that takes that away. It's like, oh, that's what it's like to have my work seen, received. And, and, and there is something that drives you, I think, with that too. But once that's done, your creativity comes back in a whole new way and it, it reinvents itself. And, yeah. and you get back to just this core of why we create, which is it feels purposeful, mm -hmm. it feels interesting, it feels challenging, it kind of, it, it's, a, it's a very alive process. Yeah, I love that. I love everything you just said. And in and, and the experience for me in the chapter in, in The Yugi Loves, what, I, what I'm ultimately writing about is being reminded again that who I am and how, because the chapter is about failure and success as well, and how we view failure and how we view success, mm. and recognizing that I don't think I will ever feel successful as it connects to my creative output, because I don't really believe that's ultimately how I define success. I feel like I feel most successful as a human being 
when I am most centered in love, most centered in compassion, most available to other human beings for real, honest, vulnerable connection, that's when I feel most lit up, yeah. you know? And I say that, so that's like my big epiphany and that's what the chapter is about. And at the same time, then Big Love comes out and I'm like, is anyone going to like my book? Is anyone going to buy? Do you know what I mean? And that's the part of it's human. Oh, yeah. Like I, I can recognize that in my heart and even intellectually that what really matters to me is how am I showing up in my life? Yeah. And yet I can get consumed anytime I put something out creative. I want people to like it. I hope people will buy it if it's something for sale. And, um, you know, we're, we're very, we're conditioned from such a young age to believe so many different things. And we're really conditioned around success and what it means to be successful creatively and otherwise. And I think to unbury ourselves from all that conditioning, to peel away those layers, we can bring awareness, we can bring more consciousness, we can get in touch with who we really are and what really matters for us. And then also know that that conditioning is going to come in because it always does, because it's a lifetime of messages that, that, and it takes a lifetime, I think, and more because I'm not convinced I'll die without feeling still attached on some level mm -hmm. to like wanting to be successful artistically in the way people receive me, you know? And it's like, okay, that's what it's like to be human. You know, I'm not going to beat myself up for, for that any more than I'll beat myself up for anything else. You were there for me when my book came out a few months back with, we, we both with New World Library, who we, adore I love. they are just Shout amazing out. yeah World. so mark allen kim, kim, corbin, kim corbin the whole team mark, yeah. um yeah and and i remember i left you because we leave marco polo messages for each mm -hmm. other which is this little video app and i left you a message going oh i feel really weird like we just moved into this office the book so we were in the middle of moving into this office which was a step up the book was about to come out mm -hmm. and i was just processing my crap and um, I remember you left me a message back going, oh, yeah, I went a bit mad when my book came out for a while. Because also you're doing all the interviews and yeah. that's, that's, that's not normal. Like you don't normally sit and talk about yourself and no. what you've just created to, you know, 50 show yeah. hosts. Yeah. And so, yeah, that was really helpful to me because I do think it's, it's a really tricky thing when you put creativity out into the world. Because I think in some ways a piece of you either goes with that creativity or can be made to go with that creativity by others. And yet in an ideal world, the best thing we would do is put them out into the world and not even look at it. Yeah. Like it's almost like, cause it's none of your business once mm -hmm. it's gone out there because yeah. everyone else is going to have their opinion and their idea. Sure. And, and I think that's the fear that we feel as creatives before mm -hmm. we're about to release something. You don't quite know what's going to hit you. And yeah. Amanda Palmer, who I know we both yeah. really admire and enjoy, she just talked about that with her latest album, which is an amazing album. And she was scared because she said the last time she went out into the big arena yeah. beyond her Patreon, uh, she got mauled because of her Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. So yeah. I, that fear is so, uh, I think it's what stops a lot of people from putting stuff out. And yet, I think if you know that's par for the course and part of the growth, you would just put your thing out. Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of vulnerability in sharing anything creative. You know, it's, Fear walks hand in hand with creativity, especially if you intend on sharing your creativity in any way. And with Big Love, this, there are a lot of really personal stories in there. Mm -hmm. So it's, it doesn't feel real. It feels real when you're, it feels real to the extent you're writing it. It's just you and your computer. Then it's you and your editor, but it's still just one other set of eyes on it. And then maybe a handful of other sets of eyes on it before it actually goes out into the world. But for the, the few weeks before this came out, I was like, oh my God, this is really going out into the world. And did I, did I have to share that? And did I have to share that? It was like everything I had shared, suddenly it was like vulnerability overload because this was becoming incredibly real. Mm. And, and yet that's what I, uh, that's when I feel most alive is when, pe when I am sharing vulnerably with others who are able to receive and share in the same way. And I believe that's ultimately not only how we heal ourselves, but we move healing forward in the world. And I know that, I mean, Amanda Palmer is a great example, is I know that the, the art I respond to most deeply, it's people who are just raw and real and, and putting their truth into the art that they're creating and sharing with the world. Like this for me is the kind of art that 
that opens me up the most. Mm. You know, it was at reading Amanda Palmer's book, The Art of Asking, mm. it was when I finished reading the book, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to do my Kickstarter campaign. That was honestly, it was like I shut the book and I was like, I had thought about doing a Kickstarter campaign for the book that came out before Big Love. And then I was like, it's time, you know, just do it. You're going to be, there's never going to, you're never going to hit a point where you're not scared to do this. So you have a choice to make. You can just either do it afraid or, or just not do it. And why would you ever choose to not do it when this is something you really feel called to do in your heart, right? That's always the choice we have to make in life. It's like fears, fear will almost always be there. Or fear will always be there when we're doing things that are in alignment with our heart and our truth that are pushing us to expand beyond our comfort zone, that there will be risks that have to be taken, Yeah. right? So the choice will always be to say no and to just stay in our box of conditioning, the tiny little box in the box of fear that keeps us small or to recognize just because fear is saying no doesn't mean I have to say no. I can still move forward. I can move forward with my fear. No problem. Fear can come along, right? As Elizabeth Gilbert says in Big Magic, beautiful book mm. on creativity for anybody out there. She says, I always have this conversation with my fear before I start my next creative project. I know you need to come along for the ride. You're just doing your job, but you get the back seat, and under no circumstance <laughs> do you get to drive. You I know? love that quote from her. Yeah. yeah, and it's a beautiful way to approach fear it is. because it's not about becoming fearless. Nobody's moving through life fearlessly. You know, it's about recognizing our fear is just trying to protect us, but it's not going away. So we got to get in the habit of moving forward with our fear if we're going to create anything, you know, create new, big, bold possibilities and connections. Creative courage isn't fearlessness. You only need courage if fear is present. Absolutely. And so I'm curious, you just mentioned it was The Art of Asking, which is a great book, by the way, Amanda <clears throat> Palmer. Um, that led you to do your Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. And I have your Kickstarter book, which is called Just Love. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing a theme, Scott. Just love, yeah. big love. Ooh, 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 oogie love. love. So you're, it's I think you're, love, when you're 85, there'll be like a love anthology. Yeah. There'll be like 30, 30, uh, 30 love items from Scott Stabile. Hopefully. Um, but I, I feel, I'm curious, because you built quite a big following on Facebook. And, you know, back in the day, it was easier to, 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 yeah. to get people to follow you. But yeah. still, 350,000 people yeah. on Facebook, they are what crowdfunded Just Love. What was that like, creating that book and having that go out and be well-received? Yeah, I mean, the truth is when Just Love came out, it was, I think I had like 35,000 people. Oh, wow. It was much smaller, mm. about a tenth of the size. I think around there, but I felt at the, I'm but like, still, that's a ton of, for me, that was like, no, I mean, I think people, for anybody, 35,000 is so, a lot of people. And I, I had been sharing so many memes on Facebook of my writing and it, and several people had reached out to me and, you know, do you have posters? Do you have a calendar? Do you have anything? And I thought this is, I would love to see this in a book, like a, a beautiful coffee table book with my words paired with photographs, which is what just love is. And I, you know, it's expensive to produce that kind of book, a book, a hard oh, cover. Yeah. And, it's, and I'm, I love the book. I think it's a beautiful book. I'm really happy with how it turned out. So I, I kind of priced it out and, and thought, well, I can't afford to do this on my own. In Kickstarter, I was just becoming more and more aware of Kickstarter and reading Amanda's book and seeing other campaigns out there. And I'm like, let's do this. You know, I have a, a great following on Facebook and engaged audience who seems to love my work. So, you know, I set out to raise $20,000 to uh, publish a thousand copies, to produce a thousand copies and met the goal, you know, ended up raising about 22,000, but it was a, it was a, I was going to be so melodramatic there. When I, when I consider the world we're living in and the real things that people have to deal with in this world, I was going to say it was a horrifically excruciating well, it process. Was. It was yeah. for you. It let's, was. let's, let's give you that. Yes. It was, uh, it, Every, every imaginable fear around worth and creativity um, came up around mm -hmm. Kickstarter because here I am now for the first time asking for money for what I'm doing, for my creativity, asking people to support something that didn't yet exist. Um, I felt really insecure. I really questioned whether or not I was worthy of people's money, of this generosity, if what I was ultimately going to produce was going to be worthy of what they're doing. I felt 
certain that people would be judging me. And I got, most people were incredibly supportive. I got a couple messages from people really put off that I was asking for money mm -hmm. to do my, you know what I mean? And it that, happens. And that was my, what, uh, such a huge insecurity within me that it felt like a dagger to the heart. You know, we, don't, we, we attach ourselves to the judgments of others when we have that same judgment within ourselves. It's when people bring things up that we're dealing with in ourselves where it, it feels extra painful. Because if I, if I weren't struggling with that in myself, I'd be able to receive these comments and maybe it would be a little ding, but it wouldn't go in like this. I, I do think that's mostly true, mm. but I also think there's another aspect, having gone through that myself yeah. a lot and, and work with other people who've gone through it. I, I also think it's when you, most people are sheltered from the crowd and what the crowd want to say because they don't live their life in response to a crowd. They might live their life in response to their family, their yeah. co-workers in one building, and they know the drill and there's a kind of form. But it is another thing to put yourself out there publicly to thousands upon thousands of people. <clears throat> and, and I think part of it is also the shock that comes that, why, why would someone say that? Because yeah. especially if you wouldn't, and, and I do, you know, I've, I've seen this, I've experienced this, it's a tricky thing. Money is often a trigger for people. Um, and it, it, I never understand it because I think, well, you don't have to buy anything. Like, yeah. nobody is, like, hammering your, you, you to the, you know, making you buy a thing. Yeah. Um, but but it, I think it's a trigger because money is just such a wounded area in the world. And understandably, it's, it's a very unfair financial system we have. A lot of people are really struggling. So I, I get where it comes from, but I... I also think the combative nature of those comments, yeah. they have an impact sometimes just because they're combative. It's yeah, like, you know, you're- true too. That's I mean, true too. I think what you said is for me, I 80% <laughs> that, but I think 20% of it is just dealing with, wow, well, this, is what, well, this, this is what it's like to be on the receiving me. end of a crowd. And yeah. a few of them decide to throw some bricks at my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I think that's yeah. true. And Kickstarter, I mean, my campaign was 30 days, mm. which doesn't sound like a long time, it is a very long time. That is like, a long time. Especially because the the way Kickstarter tends to play out and doing research about it and from my personal experience is like you get a lot of people in the beginning, the first few days, and a lot of people in the last days mm. who've waited. And then there's this whole middle ground and it just feels like it's going on and on and on. <laughs> and, and I'm already feeling insecure and um, it already feels like this heavy, very much exposed process. And I... And, embracing needing to market myself and you know needing to put myself out there and say this is what's going on and i i way overcompensated in the the other direction of not announcing it enough i remember two weeks in i wrote this long post about you know if if it feels like i'm announcing it enough too much i apologize and then and in the first comment under she's like i didn't even know you had a kickstarter <laughs> campaign you know what i mean yeah. and and when i reflect on big love uh i realize how much i overcompensated there in terms of not wanting to put myself out there too much in a way that might be distasteful for people so mm -hmm. i didn't this was one of the most exciting things in my mm -hmm. life this book coming out and i was quiet about it i was too quiet about it and and I'm realizing that's all my own insecurity. Like the whole way I approach Kickstarter, the marketing there, the whole way I approach Big Love, it's, it's my own insecurity of being judged by people. And part of what I teach in, in my workshops and in the work I do is just to, is that we can't own how other people receive us for a mm. second. We can't own how a, another person is gonna interpret my actions, how they're gonna respond to my actions or my words. And that if we, allow ourselves to be controlled by the impressions of others, we're never going to do anything mm -hmm. in our lives, you know, that worthwhile. We're just going to stay like this, right? And yet I see the ways in which I'm not honoring what I know to be true, you know? And so I'm looking at that and I'm watching that and I'm watching, I, with Big Love, I'm, refl I'm working on a new book now in, in the early stages of a new book. And I'm, I'm excited when this book comes out, whenever it happens, to approach it very differently with much more confidence and much more enthusiasm and really understanding that part of this process is of a creative being at a time when there are so many people, which is one of the most beautiful things, I'm going on a lot of different tangents here, but That's I'll good. try to come and bring it together. One of the most beautiful things about technology in the world we're living in now is that, that people can share their creativity without all the gatekeepers telling them that they can't. Totally. It's so beautiful. It's amazing. We're seeing so, so much mm -hmm. and there's so much, mm. you know, so it's hard to, 
sometimes get through everything to it, it, which is beautiful. And also I feel inundated sometimes. I'm like, I know there are so many people expressing beautiful things, but it, there's too much of it to possibly yeah. touch it all. But I know that when I'm ready to release something next time, I'm going to really stand in, in, what am I going to stand in? I'm just going to say my truth, but I'm just going to, I'm going to stand in my commitment to share whatever project it is I want to share in a big way yeah. and not worry that it's too much. If it's, you know, the beautiful thing about social media, if it's too much for some people, they can stop following you and move on to other people. And it's just like, do that. And that's so true. I think it's important to remember that because I used to have that, oh, we've already shared this once. We can't share it again three weeks yeah, later. Yeah. There's also kind of weird narcissism in that, that we assume somebody's coming to our page totally. every day. And I don't know about you, but the, I mean, I, the way I consume social media is so intermittent. Yeah. Um, and some days I'll look at the news feed and then I won't look at the news feed for three weeks. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's going on unless I, unless there are a few people that, you know, I'll target because they're like my favorites. But Absolutely. Most most of the time you don't know and you do have to stand for what you create and I I had to learn that the hard way myself um, I had a lot of resistance to that and I remember judging Jerry Hicks when I went to an Esther Hicks workshop the channeler for Abraham it was 2008 I was a few years into my public career and I judged him and was mesmerized by him at the same time because they started their workshop and the first 25 minutes of their workshop he stood up there and basically talked about all the products they had for sale outside. Wow. And me uh -huh. as a British person, yeah. I'm sitting there going, oh, what? How? you can't, you can't, you can't just stand there and tell us about all your products. Sure, because that's what I would have done. I wouldn't have, I'd have ignored the fact we had products. I wouldn't Absolutely. have even mentioned they were at the back of the room. Absolutely. And, and yet he was so right because they had, I, I then went out and I bought several of their things and I really loved those things. So all he was doing was he was being the bridge between these things they'd created they believed in yeah. and that were absolutely worth what my financial exchange was for them. And no one was forcing me. Yeah. But if he hadn't done that, I might have just gone, oh, there's a table with some stuff on. <clears throat> and having run my own events, especially in the early days, it, that also was important because physical events are expensive to yeah. run and people don't realize that. They see the ticket price. And they, they think, oh, wow, that's a lot of money. Yeah. They don't know how much you're paying the venue, how much you're paying to fly in, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. So until you get to a certain scale, it's important to be at physical events, uh, kind of engaged with everything that's going on in the room. And I see it the same way on social media with, with things you're creating. If you have a platform, I do think it's your duty to learn how to stand behind it. Yes. And that's coming from someone who didn't used to. I did the work. Mm -hmm. And the work was consumed, but I was always a bit like, oh, no, I can't do that. And, yeah. and, and it's important to, to actually just learn how to go. It's OK to be proud about my thing. I'm not trying to make someone take this. But if I don't talk about it, they don't even know it exists. Absolutely. And so much of that, it's, it's, ener it's all energy. Yeah. Everything we're doing is energy. And so how intentional are you going to be about the creativity that you're working on and that you want to share with the world? You know, the more intentional we are, the more active we are in our own promotion. It, it, it has to be a part of the equation, Yeah, I believe. Yeah. And I think it's a valuable part of the equation because essentially, if I can stand up for what I'm putting out creatively, I am standing up for myself in some way, mm. you know, which, which for me always reflects self-love. It's a way of honoring my worth. It's a way of saying that this thing that I've created is valuable simply because I am inherently valuable yeah. as we all are. Yeah. And knowing that you are inherently valuable, it makes sense that whatever you choose to share with the world will have inherent value in it because it's what you have to share, yeah. right? And you are unique, we all are. So it's a big, it's a, it's a tough one for artists and healers. Creatives so and healers similar. are the worst. Starving artists, starving yeah, healer. It's, yeah, it's, it, the story yeah. is one and the same. And it's so funny because I can talk to my artist friends and my healer friends and I can like show them all of the places where this is happening in their lives. And yet it's always most difficult with yourself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And yet I really love working with friends who are creatives <clears throat> and healers who are on that very yeah. issue. Cause I think when you've, when you've owned it a little bit more for yourself, yeah. it doesn't mean you don't have doubts or fears, but Absolutely. you just know the, you know how, what an important building block that ownership is to everything else, the creativity, the people you meet, it's just, yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's important to remind people because I know that, that you, if we look at you, for instance, 
you are, appear to be, this incredibly successful person who's, who's doing important work and that it feels like it's purposeful to what you feel called to do in mm. this world. You have a, a large audience, you're, you're, you're doing it, right? But you're not without fear. Oh. You're not without insecurity. And so for people to, to see you, they can think erroneously that, well, it's easy for him because look at where he is and now he's established and now he's successful and he has books and he has online courses and you know what I mean? Completely. But the, the, whole, the whole reason you have all that is because you were willing to show up with your fear. You didn't shut down. You didn't close down in the face of your insecurities. You know what I mean? You, you, I'm speaking for you. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you just follow yeah, me around? This is all just truth. Yeah. <laughs> this is your truth I'm sharing right now. You know, but the reality is there's no, there's no successful it. person out there who did not get there without also confronting mountains of insecurities oh, and fears completely. because we're all human and we're all dealing with it. When we, you know, I shared earlier that the, the, the moving into this office studio coincided with the release of the book. And I was like in fetal position for, for a few weeks, like really, because I was in here like building furniture and it was a big investment. And, and, and it was a commitment to, okay, well, if we're taking this on and investing the money that we're investing in and things like this podcast, I'm just trusting that things aren't going to tank yeah. in a month. But yeah. what I had to tell myself was, well, if things tank, I'll figure it out. You know, Absolutely. it's like, but, it, but all that stuff comes up. And I, I love that you share that because a friend just uh, left me a voice message the other day. She was saying, I just want to know, how did you find your purpose? Because you're someone I really admire because you live your purpose and you have your life and you have this successful work, but I also see you taking time for your life. And I sh said, oh, I still think what's my purpose all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, cause I think that's human. Like I yeah. get that from the outside, you look like, oh, you're doing all these things. But I think it's human to go, am I doing, or, or it is for me anyway. I, I'm, I'm, I'm someone who's always thinking, should I still be doing this? Um, like, you know, I'll yeah. have those thoughts. Yes. And I think it's the, it's the, creative mind, the visionary mind, it's always curious about what's next and what's new. And yeah. I, I think part of that has, has to be willing to break down what already exists in order mm -hmm. to rebuild something else. Yeah. So I know we don't have much more time, even though I can talk to, I can talk to you for hours and I, I'd love to get you on the show again, because I think we mm -hmm. could explore some more, but I just want to quickly touch on, you do a lot of workshops where mm -hmm. you walk people through creative processes, processes as writers uh, that really are self-growth workshops yeah. wrapped up as creativity workshops. And I was just curious about those. And Yeah, they're really not even creativity workshops, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, the I one is called Writing Yourself, and it's a writing workshop, but it's using writing as a tool for self-exploration, for self-reflection, and for growth. Now, the beautiful thing about that is what I, what I believe ultimately is any work we're doing on ourselves, anytime we're getting deeper into our truth, in the truth of who we are, we serve our creativity. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I feel like it's not really a creativity workshop, but it absolutely serves creativity because our creativity is served by truth, yeah. right? And, and the more clear we get about who we are and who we are not, the more we can bring aspects of who we really are to whatever it is we're doing creatively, mm -hmm. right? And the more we can start discarding the nonsense, the bullshit, the conditioning, the, the stuff that we have felt we have to bring to our creativity, you know, and, and that's powerful, yeah. you know, and there's nothing I enjoy more than sitting in a circle of people and getting to the real shit, yeah. like talking about why we are really here on this planet or just talking about like what feels good, mm. you know, what is feeling okay, what is not feeling okay and how can we align our lives more with things that actually create more peace and joy and meaning in our lives and how can we start getting rid of the stuff that doesn't mm. right and starting to pay attention to what what that does for us as human beings as creative human beings as compassionate human beings discarding the bullshit giving more energy to truth it always serves everything yeah. right i mean that's the essence the summit we were in was basically creativity as a means of spiritualities yeah that's all i'm talking about that's yeah. all i'm doing in the workshops i'm doing it's more like the spiritual aspect and how it's going to serve every part of your life yes moving forward and so i naturally get a lot of creative people in it because creatives i mean we're all creative but people who are really focused on their creativity and creative outlet they're tapped into 
their spirituality. There's really no and their separation. Sensitivity, their sensitivity. Usually, yeah. you know, people who are very sensitive. And Absolutely. The, the, it kind of goes hand in hand. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. So if I wanted to check out one of your workshops, I could go to your website at... Yeah. Scottstabile.com. Perfect. And you and I are doing a uh, scottstabile.com. And you and I are doing a creativity workshop together, wait. which I we've know. never done before. No. And we're super excited. Yeah. And we're doing that in February of 2020. So yeah. you can find details on that at leeharrisenergy.com or scottstabile.com. Yeah. And I thank you so much for today. I think there's so much of value for any creative. And it's just always great to hear your journey, whether it's on Facebook or in your book or, or live. So for anybody who's tuned in and has enjoyed it, I highly encourage you to get Scott's book, Big Love, and Thank check you. him out on Facebook and his website. And brother from another mother, yes. love you very much. Thank you, brother. Thank you, you for too. being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so yeah. much. You have been listening to Impact the World. For more of my work, please visit leeharrisenergy.com. And to attend my five-day Impact the World in-person training event held in Scottsdale, Arizona in April 2020, visit leeharrisenergy.com forward slash impact.